Greetings from First Missionary Baptist Church of Cave Springs, Arkansas. My name is Ernest Lostovic, and we will be reading from Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 20 to begin with, and then finish up with verses 21 through 25. Anyway, we are having a wonderful time, wonderful day in the Lord. Uh, it's a beautiful day to take it in. And may God bless the reading of the word today because uh, it's our conversation, it's our fellowship with God himself. That's important to remember. So as we read uh, Mark 4 today, our focus will be on the importance of hearing God's word, as Jesus said, with ears of understanding. We have to hear seeking what he has for us. We can't just hear it and evaluate it and superfluously just let it go. We have to try to understand what he's saying to us. So that's the important part of it. And as we read, we will have uh, here a story that Jesus told another multitude. And beginning with verse 1, he began again to teach by the seaside and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. So again, we see a place where he has put his back to the sea, and he's speaking in a natural-made amphitheater. Uh, when the flood came upon the earth in Noah's day, it changed the topography of the world tremendously. And God in all his wisdom and all his futuristic knowledge formed these amphitheaters by the sea where Jesus Christ could speak and the hills would magnify his voice, hold his voice so that it would be able to be heard clearly for a long distance. It's amazing what God can do. He had that all that plan. He had already fixed it so that Jesus Christ, when he came, could preach to the multitudes off the Sea of Galilee. And this amazing God still wants us to hear the words of Jesus. And that's what we're reading today. Without an amphitheater, but we do have technology that sends it out into the whole world, if necessary. Now, moving on to verses 2 and uh, following, we will come to see a parable. Of course, we learned a little bit about that last week. We see this parable, and it means a worldly story with a heavenly meaning. So it's something that we can see and understand applied to the deeper meaning, which is spiritual. So let's read verses 2 and following to see this parable. And he taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some an hundred. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this parable. And Lord, we thank you for the knowledge that Jesus gave us to understand it. And as we move on, as we look at it verse by verse, we'll see how an agricultural society could see exactly what he was talking about. And Lord God, we pray that you will bless the reading of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, and we see this parable. He uses earthly things. Well, this is going to be a sower. We see the picture, a sower of wheat or barley, seeds with the bag slung over his shoulder, with the seed 
for the planting, and he walks in a straight line through the field, and he throws handfuls of the seed in a semicircular motion as he walks, and he covers about a 20-foot path, and when he gets to the edge of the field, he turns around, steps off 20 feet, and goes back in the same direction, doing the same thing in the same pattern until he finishes the whole field. Well, when he gets to the point where he's got the whole field covered, we're, we know that there would be paths where people walk in that area, uh, maybe even a road. And as he went to the edges of the field, of course, some of it would fall on bare ground, hard ground, packed by uh, livestock traveling, by the people traveling, and whatever the seed would be exposed. So we see that as he then threw the seed, some fell on the hard, unplowed soil of the pathway or road. And of course, the birds see the seeds. They're all exposed right out in the open. And they come down, swoop down on it, and eat it. And they, Jesus, of course, has an answer for that. But we also see the, the uh, position of it, that that seed, even though it was thrown out on the ground, didn't have a chance to take root, to sprout, or anything. It would become food for the birds. And then verses 5 and 6, we see that some fell on stony ground. Well, this stony ground, we here in northwest Arkansas know exactly what stony ground is. We try to avoid it as much as possible. Uh, we live with it, but sometimes it doesn't serve our purposes very well because the soil is not very deep over the top of the rocks. We uh, sometimes have a slab of bedrock with only an inch or two of soil on top of it, or even three or four inches of soil on top of it that dries out very quickly. So if we were to plant seeds in that, we would have to have a continuous supply of water to keep moisture while the seeds were sprouting. Here he says um, most of that when it dried out, when the sun came out, it would, even if the seed had sprouted, even if it had tried to take root, it would not have the moisture to survive and it would die. So it had no depth of soil to do anything. Verse 6 said when the sun was up, it was scorched. And then we go to verse 7, another tricky place. Some of the plowed field had these patches of nasty thorns, weeds, all types of uh, vegetation that could not be um, overcome by plowing. And the seeds that went in there, of course, they sprouted and came up with the weeds, as most farmers know, grow faster than the crop. The result of such an environment is a losing battle the uh, crop, in this case wheat or barley, would be smothered. And of course, if anyone remembers working in a garden that had tall weeds, your vegetables would grow spindly and you have no harvest. This, the plants would be too weak to produce any fruit. So uh, we see here that that was not a place for it to be. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up, choked it, and it yielded no fruit. So it was a waste of time. Verse 8, then we get to the nitty-gritty. We find that some seed naturally fell on fertile ground. Good soil, deep, moisture was right. The root systems of the seeds grew naturally. And some of the seed, of course, produced. Well, all the plants on the good ground then began to produce. All those others were either dead and gone, or they were weak and spindly with no fruit. So, Jesus said, these that fell on good ground brought forth some 30, some 60, and some 100. One seed produced a plant that produced 30 more seeds. Another plant produced 60 more seeds and other plants a hundred more seeds. From one to a hundred, a great increase in production, and the harvest was good. 
Well, he says an interesting statement in verse 9. He said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Well, this is so important that it is recorded by Matthew in chapters 13, verses 1 through 23, and Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 15. Jesus gets the crowd's attention with this parable, this story, and he has ours now. What did he mean by this? What was the heavenly meaning? Why did he go to so much trouble to declare something that all the farmers already knew, yet they were asking why and what? Well, verse 10 tells us that some of them had questions. When he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. And, when he, was, and he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. Okay. Some of the crowd, even the, some, even the twelve apostles, were curious about the point of this object lesson story. They were the ones that ears to hear. They were the ones that were supposed to understand it. In the agricultural society of Jesus' day, much of the crowd which heard the story took it at face value and said, yep, that's exactly right. That's what happens. The farmer has to watch for these things and be ready for them, be able to not plant the seeds in the wrong places and do all these things which have no, no profit. When we read the stories in the Bible today, do we not also read them sometimes superficially and then just apply it to the person or the character that the story is about? Um, we simply take them as historical stories and history, and we don't see that God has a meaning for the reader. That's me, that's you as we read the Word. God has something there for us as individuals, and we are to have ears to hear. God's Word is for whoever opens this Bible. It's not just a history book. It is a book of God conversing with us, questioning us, making our minds stretch to understanding his word. The word of God can be understood because we are indwelled by God's Holy Spirit. We are believers. We are to be able to read the word and listen to the Holy Spirit's lead and his explanation. So we should have these ears to hear. And the Holy Spirit speaks out and says, Behold, when you read this, you are that person. You are the one that is talking about. You are either a sower or you are a hearer or you are a reaper. All these things point to child of God. Verse 11 said, Unto you it's given. Unto you it's given. Understanding, that's what's given that only Jesus can explain, and now he's going to explain. And today we as believers have that Holy Spirit to help us. John 14 and 26 tells us, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. If you are a believer, this applies to you. So today, do you have ears to hear? Well, you have ears to hear unto you, it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. Praise God for that. The lost world only hears the parable, doesn't understand the parable. Now we listen closely to verse 12. That seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. This is a hard verse to comprehend. Surely God would want everyone to understand. Surely God, he would want us to understand the parable and be converted and be saved. 
Well, here he seems to be saying only certain ones could comprehend. Well, we find that Jesus is quoting what he had told Jeremiah many centuries before in Isaiah 6, 9, and 10. He said, go and tell this people. This is God's instruction. You might as well say Jesus' instruction because he wrote the word. He told Isaiah, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, make their eyes heavy, shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. That's what Isaiah's message was to the people. He was going to tell them everything that they needed to hear, yet they were so caught up in their own little religious circles, so in their own little government, in their own uh, audacity before God, that they would not listen to the words of Isaiah and his prophecies, and they simply carried on just like if they were blind, and just like if they were hard of hearing. Perhaps we have here a glimpse of the fact that many people believe only what they want to believe, and only will believe what they see, and only believe in their own strength and what they can do. Reading John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, it says here, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Jesus Christ could look over that multitude and knew who was going to hear and who was not going to hear. Well, without a permanent heart, without a repentant heart, we are still blind and deaf to the word. Once we are filled with the Holy Spirit, once we believe God's word, once we know in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, once we know that it's his redemption we seek and not anything else, then he gives us this Holy Spirit. Once we believe, the scripture says, we're filled and indwelt with that Holy Spirit of promise. So that spirit of promise, the Holy Spirit also gives us all wisdom to understand God's Word. So if we are believers, we have that ability then to have ears to hear. Look at verse, verse 13. And he said to them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will ye know all parables? He's asking these disciples and the apostles. They're needing an explanation. And Jesus gladly gives it to those who have these ears to hear. They are concerned. They want to know what he's talking about. The crowds, the multitude, says we know all about farming. And he told the truth, but that's as far as it went in their eyes. So here, how embarrassing for his own disciples when he asked, don't you understand this parable? If you don't understand this one, how are you going to understand all the other ones? He said, we are to apply it, well, I'm applying it to myself, applying it to me and you. How are we to understand? By the lead of the Holy Spirit and the studying and meditating on his word. We meditate on the written word with a, par with a prayerful attitude and a repentant heart. The Psalms tell us that. God will not despise. He will not set it aside. That's what's required. A heart that's humble before God and with prayer and repentance seeking his word. Look at verse 14. The sower soweth the word. Well, who's the sower? Who is this sower? If we are believers and we're speaking the word of God to others, then we are sowing the seed. It says here that that seed is the word of God. So we're the ones. We've been given the authority and the responsibility to spread the word of God, to sow the seed. And 
we are to be witnesses, and as Christians, then we become seed planters. The Word of God, the written Word, of course, but what we really need to be about is teaching and preaching Jesus. That is planting the seed. Because a lot of people still don't have ears to hear, they see us, they evaluate us, and our actions or character should be of Jesus. Then they begin to see Jesus in us. Then they begin to listen. And then God gives them the ears to hear. Going on to verse 15. These are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Some of the word falls on hard, calloused hearts. And the devil snatches the words away because they are laying on top. They're laying on top where they're not sprouting into the heart. The word cannot sink into the heart and heart. It just lays there and Satan sweeps it away. Hebrews 4 and 7 says, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. With those ready ears to hear, then the seed has more chance of being able to grow and sprout in the heart of the believer. Verses 16 and 17. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. Here we see the stony ground, those who hear the word and receive it gladly, but their faith is shallow. And because the faith is superficial, it dries up and shrivels away with no nourishment. Baby Christians who dry up and down the vine when the going gets tough, when they're not continually fed the milk of the word, they lose the root and shrivel up, dry away. Verses 18 and 19. These are they which sown among thorns, such as hear the word. It's perhaps the saddest of the three examples because we send out babes in Christ into the world, into the choking aspects of society. John 16, 33 says it plainly. In the world ye shall have tribulation. If you put a baby, a newborn baby, out on its own into the world, it cannot make it. The world immediately tries to kill it. We have to nurture the baby. Well, the babes in Christ need that nurturing also. They need a faith that's going to be rooted into a deeper faith through our association, through our care, through our prayers, through our examples, all these things. They're going to suffer tribulation, but also the slings and arrows of Satan. And, of course, it's always thrown at a child of God. So many young people who have accepted Christ are then forced into society, uh, perhaps the workplace. As beginners, they have to work the night shift. That takes them out of any uh, social Christian work at night in the churches. They have to work on weekends to keep their jobs, especially Sundays. They begin to stay out of church because it's either the job or Christ and their faith being small, they choose the job. Uh, slowly but surely, that young person can be separated from their faith in Christ. Verse 17 also tells us when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake immediately they are offended well 19 says the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches how many times have we heard i have to go to work so that i can have this so i can have that so i can do this and do that but the riches then cloud their associations with the Lord Jesus Christ and their dependency on him. They begin to depend on the job and on the money. And the lusts of other things enter in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. 
So they become that young plant that's shaded out by the weeds, that young plant that's starved out by the weeds' need of the nutrition that was there for the young plant. Starved out, spindling, cannot bloom, cannot bear fruit. And of course, that's our job as children of God, is to bear fruit. If a person is like this in Christ, immature, they soon backslide into the world and then become fruitless. Jesus here gets right to the point. It is usually money. The deceitfulness of riches. Look at verse 20. And these are they which are sown on good ground. That's our example. That's the one we want to exploit as much as possible, to look into the good ground of deep faith and good nourishment and good nurturing by the Word of God. They hear the Word, receive it, bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some an hundred. They're, they're open to the Word. It becomes hid in their rich and fertile hearts, and the Word grows and matures into a faith which is immovable, something to stand on a great foundation and a base. And they begin to flourish and bear much fruit, and possibly at different amounts, but all providing some. Remember the fruit of the Spirit, which is talked about in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. It says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, all these things, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, and goodness. All these are the fruit of the Spirit, and that fruit of the Spirit then with such a character that you exhibit the love of Christ flows out into others and then the others then become the fruit that we are to be bringing into the kingdom. With a witness like that, others cannot help but come to Jesus also. Then we see in verses 21 through 25 another parable. Verse 21, And he said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel, or under a bed, and not to be set on a candlestick? For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. What is this parable? The light of the word is not to be hidden or dimmed. Who is the light of the word? Jesus Christ. Jesus is the light of the world. We as believers are to put Jesus in a prominent place in our lives. Place in our lives, like Matthew 5 and 16 tells us simply, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. A simple statement, but it's all the truth. You don't hide your salvation. You don't sit on it. You let it glow through you. And that's what Jesus is telling here. Don't hide your salvation. Show it gladly. Jesus is to be manifested in his own witnesses. He gives us that responsibility. It is so secret what God can do. What God has done for you, don't keep it a secret. Tell it to the nations. Tell it to everyone you meet. Jesus saves. He saved me, and I want everyone to know it, and I want everyone else to be saved because Jesus Christ is the only way. That is what he's talking about here. Don't sit on your salvation and gloat on it and say, I'm saved and satisfied. You will show no fruit. Shame on us. Verses 23 and 24, if we have ears for Christ, we are to use those ears. Listen to what you hear. Verse 24, and he said to them, Take heed what you hear. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured unto you, and unto you that hear shall more be given. Well, listen to what you hear. Use and broadcast, just like the sower broadcasting the seed. Broadcast what you hear with wisdom and discretion. And the more we are faithful with, 
the more we are faithful with what God has given us, the more truths God will give. When we know the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ and his word, we are to tell it. And all that we understand, we can tell. And when we can do that, then he gives us more, and he gives us more. As we study and read the word and pray and ask, the more and more he gives us. Verse 25, I believe here we see the giving of truth. More understanding of God's word. The more we know of Jesus, the more we give out. And then the more we are given to pass on. The more we learn, the more we give. If we don't grow in the truth, if we stagnate, then we are apt to lose even what we have. There's a sad statement there, isn't it? For he that hath to him shall be given, and he that hath not from him shall be taken even that which he hath. If we sit on such a glorious salvation and don't use it to spread the word unto the masses, then we become stagnant, bitter. We become useless to God. I can't explain it all, but what I do know, I pass it on. 2 Timothy 2.15 gives us the key for this. It says, study to show yourself approved of God, a workman not ashamed that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Always it comes back to the truth of the word. We are to share it and not be ashamed of it. And then we have to understand it. We have to hear what the Holy Spirit has led us into and then rightly divide it, discern what is necessary at the time, and then pass it on, giving it out. So in conclusion, Jesus taught we should listen to his word. Listen to his word with ears of understanding. Pray for understanding. Pray heartily that as you read his word, that he will give you the understanding that you need so that you can tell others. When we speak, we must realize that everyone will not hear. But we can't use that as an excuse. We have to be aware that it's Satan who stops their ears. Don't allow the cares of the world to dim our vision. Don't say, well, I'll speak tomorrow because I'm too busy today. At the time that you are to be heard, that's the time that you are to speak. And then know that there are hearts out there ready to hear. Because God promised us that he would prepare those that we come in contact with when he was holding them up to us to hear the word that we would be ready to give the word because he prepares the fields. He repa prepares souls to hear the word of God at his time and not our time. So always be ready. They're provided by God to hear and accept the word and then to stand against the wild wiles of Satan. Keep hearing, keep hearing and understanding, and God will continue to contribute more to your understanding. What an amazing God we have that loves us enough to save us and then uses us for his glory and not ours. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word and all that we've learned today. And help us to understand that we are responsible for the things that he has given us. That we are responsible and that we are to be used as sowers to spread the gospel. Thank you, Lord, for your word again. Forgive me my sin, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.